So thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, today we are here as part of the Sustainability Festival for Bass Coast and we'll be hearing from Anne and Bob Davey to tell us some stories about new farming, a Bimbadan case study. So to make a start, I'm just going to do a quick introduction to why we're all here today. Totally Renewable Phillip Island has organised some of the events, uh, hosting some of the events for the Sustainability Festival. And we're particularly excited about this festival because the theme is future homes and farms for 2040, empowering people to adapt. So we think it's absolutely critical that we all get going where we want to go as soon as possible. And Anne and Bob today are a brilliant example of what can be achieved. So I'd like to, first of all, pay our respects to the First Nations people of Australia and acknowledge the Bunurong and our neighbours, the Gunai Kurnai, as the true owners and custodians of the land, seas and life, whose lands we're striving to protect and renew. So I'll just do a very quick introduction to what Totally Renewable Phillip Island is, or Trippy, as we like to call ourselves. So we're known, commonly known as a movement or a forum. So a collection or group of individuals who are passionate about changing for a positive future. We're all in it together. And our mission is carbon neutral by 2030, which is rapidly progressing. So this, this is the structure of Trippy. So we've got currently 15 member groups and organisations and six working groups as well. And you'll see uh, very proudly here, we have Bimberdeen as well as one of our member groups. We're also looking at expanding some of the things we've been up to with Trippy into some of the other waterline communities. So that's an active uh, plan of ours for the next year, or I should say year or eight. <laughs> So without further ado, what I would like to do now is introduce Anne and Bob to us today. So, so we've got Anne here. Now, Anne has done a very beautiful um, recorded voice session for us. So what I'm going to endeavour to do is play some of the amazing footage of Bimba Dean, and we have a lot of it, which is absolutely brilliant. So. Um, I encourage laughter if there are any glitches <laughs> and we'll see how we go. <laughs> this is the story of Bimbadeen. I speak today on the land of the Bunurong, Malau, Phillip Island. Pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who live in our community today. Every day we walk on Aboriginal land. As far as I'm aware, my only ancestor connected to the land was my great grandfather. His name was John Blake, a farmer from Northern Ireland. He sailed to Australia in 1863 with his new young wife, Ellen. They landed in Melbourne and headed for the Bendigo goldfields, never returning to a life on the land. I inherited a love of Phillip Island from my grandfather, James Joseph Blake, who brought his family, including my mother, then six years old, for a holiday in Bayview Guest House in 1912. My parents brought my brother and I for our first holiday in 1942, when I also was six years old. We stayed in the public schools camp on Lover's Walk. I believed I had discovered where the fairies lived. The place was like magic to me in the fearful time of war. From then on, the island was to be in my DNA. I met a young farmer, Bob Davey, in 1949, when my parents, my brother Neil and I, came for a holiday at his parents' guest house, Erewhon, on the Esplanade in Cowes. I did not know then that my life's journey was to be connected to the land. Bob had to leave school early at 15 and worked as a farm labourer to John Gardner, a dairy farmer on Back Beach Road, Ventnor. John was a hard taskmaster. Bob learned that whilst farming was extremely constant work, it was very satisfying. Bob's father, Stan, had helped Bob's older brother, Bill, purchase Meekings Farm on Troutman's Road, Ventnor. 
Bill and his wife renovated the old house and milked cows and raised pigs. In 1954, Bob's father helped him purchase 120 acres belonging to Richie Betts on the Back Beach Road. The abandoned Troutman's house on Troutman's Road was converted into a dairy. There are still remnants of it today. Studying physiotherapy at Melbourne University, I would stay with Bob's parents when I came down by bus to see Bob for the weekend. It was my first experience of farming. Bob and I would go out each morning in the ute. I learned how to milk cows and feed pigs. Many of the paddocks were covered with scotch thistles and I spent hours matting. I loved the beauty of the sunrises and the sunsets, which till then I had never really noticed. Bob and I needed to build a house on the farm before our marriage in November 1956. Back Beach Road was then a dirt track, but we felt it would soon be improved when the power and telephone came to Ventnor. We walked over the top paddock with Bob's father and chose a site 80 meetings, meters from the road. It was the time to choose a name for our farm, which was to be our home and the place to bring up our family. We wanted an Aboriginal name. We knew that people had walked over this land thousands of years before us. From then the farm was known as Bimberdine, an Aboriginal female name meaning a place of good view. I just loved our Jersey dairy herd. Goldie, Ladybird, Wilma, Wanda, Ivy, Patch, they were like family. But my favourite was my namesake Anne. She had huge brown eyes and eyelashes you would die for and a walk like Marilyn Monroe. Bob and I returned from our New South Wales honeymoon to our house that had not yet been completed. There was mud everywhere and Bob had to carry me over the threshold standing on a fruit box. Our toilet was an arrangement in the coke shed in the backyard that had two water tanks on top. The coke was used in the Arga stove. There was not a tree in sight and the house must have looked like a pimple on a pumpkin. There was no power or telephone and we had a generator and a kerosene refrigerator. The Argus stove heated the water. The only people I knew on the island were Ros and Jeff Wilkinson who ran the dairy farm down the road. Ros and I still ring each other every second Friday. They have had three moves since leaving the island. Bob planted oats in the paddocks below the house and we would move the electric fence on our way to do the milking each morning so that a fresh strip was waiting for the cows after they were milked. I loved rearing the beautiful Jersey calves. When Bimberdine was purchased, there was a considerable amount of Melicoleuca ericifolia tea tree. The Department of Agriculture advised to plough it in as they said it was useless. Decades later, when salinity became a big problem at Bimberdine, we realised this had been very bad advice. The milk was separated and the cream sent to Murray Goldman Butter Factory at Archie's Creek. The skim milk was fed to the large white pigs. The pigs were also fed with scraps from the Erewhon guest house. We took Bimberdine milk and cream into the guest house and provided pork from our pigs slaughtered on the farm. The cheque from Murray Goldman was very welcome at the end of the month. I only went into cows once a week to shop and always had an account at each shop and paid monthly by cheque. The co-op rang up each more Friday morning for the grocery order, which was then delivered. The bakery left the bread in the mailbox. The butcher would also send meat out, taking the order into the post office to come out with our mail delivery. Daring is a hard life and constant. The good times were when the butter price was high and the pig feed low price. No season was ever the same. Often long, dry summers with blazing skies and no rain, and often long, wet, dark winters. It was hard when you had to bring the reluctant cows through the muddy paddocks. Washing the caked mud off the udders was quite a challenge for the operator and the animal. Farm water was dependent on rainfall filling the dams and our house tanks. It was always a joy when there was an early autumn break, as it meant there would be some feed going into winter. And because farmers are resilient, the good seasons, whilst often few and far between, always prevailed over the memories of the harsh years. Bob and I planted a hundred Lambertiana cypress before we were married along Back Beach Road and the west side of the house from the shelter from the strong winds. 
It was difficult to get a garden growing around the house and my mother used to bring with her different plants to try. After our bath at night, we would bucket the water onto the gardening, hoping that things would survive. When we later had children, we all took turns bathing in the same water at the end of the day to try and conserve what was left in the tanks. There was always an argument about whose turn it was to have the first bath and whose turn to pull out the plug. Water worries were eased in 1967 when the farmers brought the water being piped across the island out to Ventnor. The herd tester visited every month so that we could see which cows produced the most butterfat. He tested in the evening and morning and stayed the night at Bimberdine. Some of the herd testers were unusual, to say the least. Anne, physiotherapist farmer, was then a murrah. It was a very fulfilling time of my life. I loved the closeness of the family, working hard together on the farm. The boys, Stephen, Richard and Andrew, helped with the chores, chores at the dairy, washing up and sweeping the yard. They also brought up the cows to be milked. Later on, when the boys were at school, Elizabeth would spend time with Bob on the farm when I was away working. In the 1960s, there were many farms on the island. They were mostly dairying and sheep grazing. Couples with four children raised their families on 80-acre properties. Life was not easy, and the local football and Saturday night of the pictures in the Shire Hall provided welcome relief. Of course, there was no such thing as an annual holiday and the trip to Cowes was the highlight of the week. The farming community was close-knit and any family having a tough time would always have plenty of willing hands to help things out. Bob and I had taken out a loan to buy Bill and Beth's farm in the 1960s. Hurricane Hill, now the home of Elizabeth and her family, came on the market when the Byron Moore family decided to sell and then our property next door became on the market. And so suddenly Bimberdine became 360 acres. In 1967, butter fat price was low. There was a severe drought and the price of pig feed rocketed. We realized that the future of dairying was grim in the short term and that our beautiful jerseys had to be sold. Beef raising was a decision if we were going to continue farming. Bob started to explore ideas for the breed to start at Bimberdy in her beef herd. The family went to Queensland to inspect Ted Kirk's Brahmin cattle. When some arrived at Bimberdy, the locals were intrigued with the animals with their long floppy ears and a hump on their back. Farmers thought they were a crazy idea. The children loved the two magnificent Brahmin bulls that came to Bimberdy. They were named Donnie and Peter and were the sires of the emerging herd. Bimberdine over time bred a very successful Brangus herd with a 5.8 and 3.8 Brahman percentage. It became one of the most recognised herds in Australia. It was devastating in early 2000 when one of our animals at Canamble tested positive for Yoni's disease and the herd had to be destroyed. Tough times and devastating for Bob. It was fortunate there was some compensation from the federal government and as a result, a Bimberdean herd was restarted after two years, this time concentrating on Angus. From 1987, Bob and I became actively involved with Phillip Island Landcare, one of the first in Victoria. With their assistance, we started revegetating Bimberdean. Actually, Andrew, our son, did the first tree planting on Bimberdean when he brought home some eucalypts from Wonthaggy High School, and they were planted along Pyramid Rock Road. Andrew also had a small chook business in the old shed at Reese's when his brothers went to boarding school. The tree planting at Bimberdine continues today. Thousands of trees, ground cover, grasses and plants have been planted and the benefits are evident with an enhanced landscape, shelter for animals and increased bird life. When I sold my physiotherapy practice in 1996, I decided that after years of being involved with human health, I would do some caring for the environment. I became a community representative at the West Gippsland Catchment Management Authority. This enabled me to be on the front line to hear and learn about the latest ideas in land management. I enrolled in the environmental management course and after two years, Bimberdine had a system in place 
and became ISO 1041 common client. My first exercise at Bimberdeen was to remove the severe weed infestation around Reese's old house. Box thorn was everywhere. And so after a lot of work, we, it was restored and it became classified as land for wildlife. It was about this time Bob and I started our wonderful trips out country with Northwest Safaris. Because of these experiences, I learned the power of the land, the sky, the rocks and the water, and their spiritual connection to Aboriginal people. I believe that many farmers see their properties in terms of seasons, markets, paddocks and weeds. They do not have a sense that the land has its own enduring entity, that it has been here for thousands of years. It has its own story. Aboriginal people believe that the land owns them and they do not own it. It is for all to share and take only what is needed. They believe that the terrain is a narrative and song like rain unites the sky with the earth and the day with the stars at night. In the 1980s, Bob and I purchased the properties of the Cappies and Cruel, who rule now the farm of Richard and his family. It was a spiritual experience to come across the Aboriginal middens in the foreshore vegetation above the McCaffey's Lagoon, to sit and look, look across the bay in silence, knowing the first people had visited. One day Bob took an Aboriginal man to walk through the sand dunes at McCaffey's. The man suddenly became very distressed and to shake. He had to walk away from the site, explaining that it felt it was where Aboriginal women had been taken and that it was a place of sorrow and violence. Bob and I had noted many times that this piece of land was always bare. Nothing ever grew there. Bob and I would often drive to McAfee's early in the morning before the day became hot. It was the best time to attack the weeds such as apple of Sodom. I often experienced a sense of the spirit of the first people who we, who we know visited in the summer months. We employed someone to clean out the wonderful lagoon when it was low in the drought. We created and planted out two small islands. The islands have for years now been covered with vegetation and the full lagoon has an abundance of wildlife. We felt it was something we could, we could do to honour the first people to Malau. The land is always changing with the variability of seasons. There is rarely a year that has the perfect weather conditions, mild summer and winter, and just the right amount of rain. How well I remember the hot summers of the drought years, the endless days of scorching sun in a cloudless sky, the burnt brown paddocks, deep cracks in the ground, empty dams, the sound of the cicadas, the cattle seeking shade and the call of thirsty birds. One would see the dark clouds build up, hear the cracks of thunder, a few drops of rain on the roof, followed by silence. But all the joy when the rains do come, birds fill the sky and their sound is almost deafening. They seem to come from everywhere. Overnight the paddocks turn green and the air is sweet and fresh. The land is alive again. Harsh winters are truly gruesome. They're endless day arc days with only occasional sunshine. Cold driving winds bring hail and sleet. I can recall the memories of lying in bed at night, listening to the merciless rain, knowing the animals are out in it, many of them carving their, car, carving their calves. And then the joy of the first sunny dry day. Spring is around the corner. You listen and can hear the land again. I believe Bob and I have fulfilled a dream that Bimberdeen be a place of good view. We have been privileged to care for with our family, part of Phillip Island. It has welcomed international young volunteers. School children have come to learn about life on a farm and participated in tree planting. They have all left a legacy. Local artists come here to paint and the camera club photograph the farm in the different seasons. Community planting days have a real buzz. Students from RMIT and Monash University have undertaken research. Bimberdeen has hosted many land care information days, the most recent being a carbon farming day. 
People come together and meet to plan a community action against perceived threat to the island's natural environment. The family will never forget the look of the joy on the faces of the refugees and asylum seekers when they visit, getting close to the animals and sharing rides on the tractor. Bimberdeen's farm tours provide families and their children for many the first farm experience. International guests staying in the farm retreat speak of their joy seeing a family farm in action and the wonderful feeling of open space. Bimberdeen eggs are enjoyed by local and Melbourne people as their breakfast choice. Bimberdeen beef is popular. The cafe is a gathering place for the local community and visitors. Bimberdeen has hosted an Australian Governor General, but for Bob and I, our favoured visitor is the late John Clark, who knocked on our front door one evening seeking assistance as his car had broken down on Pyramid Rock where he was filming his beloved birds at dusk. Our joy is that our children and grandchildren have a sense of this place and an abiding connection. It is Bob and my hope that Bimberdeen continues to be a place of good view, that the land will talk and continue to be a source of knowledge and joy. Good day everyone. My name is Bob Davy and I carbon farm on our 128 hectare family property Bimberdeen on Phillip Island, Victoria. I acknowledge the Bunurong people as the first peoples of the land we are privileged to live and care for. This land was never ceded. I pay my respects to the present, past and emerging. My wife Anne and I commenced farming in 1956, the year we were married after six years as a couple from the age of 14. We are on a family run farm at Ventnor Phillip Island in Victoria. Our sons and daughter and our grandchildren all assist. The farm runs cattle, stud angers, 2,000 laying hens, tourist accommodation and carbon soil sequestration. Our family are three sons and a daughter, 10 grandchildren and three great grandchildren. The photo shows from left to right, Steve, Elizabeth, Bob, Anne, Richie and Andrew. We have been involved with land care since 1989. Bimberdeen was in the Land Care Australia Greenhouse Challenge in 2002 and the Western Port Ag Emissions Project from 2005 to 2008. We are active on climate change and members of Farmers for Climate Action and Carbon Farmers of Australia. Our property management of stock trees and water are all compliant with an ISO 14001 accreditation. Bimberdeen is a land for wildlife property. We had a greenhouse gas emissions audit in 2004 we are now audited every two years for greenhouse gas emissions and carbon sequestration in soils, trees and vegetation. We were declared carbon neutral at an event in Melbourne Park in July 2014. This was our 2019 audit of 649 tonnes of CO2. This equates to 176 tonnes of total organic carbon. This is easily accounted for by carbon soil sequestration and tree plantings. The Bimberdeen baseline was established as per our first testing. 
This was allocated by percentage of carbon in soil tests over 50 years ago, when all soil tests were 10 centimetres. In following years, carbon testing was done to 30 centimetres, then 45 centimetres and now 100 centimetres. We have adjusted our baseline to 100 tonne of total organic carbon per hectare. Our total organic carbon is monitored and documented as it changes. Changing carbon, trades and gifts. We trade carbon under the voluntary market under contract and guarantee to hold the carbon in our soils for one year at $25 per tonne of CO2 equivalent. Trades are removed from the inventory as they happen. All paddocks are ID numbered, GPS positioned and able to see by satellite or on Google Earth. Pasture management includes short, fast and high density grazing followed by a long rest period. Multi-species crops are grown including legumes that pull in nitrogen from the atmosphere, thus assisting both growth and breaking down of dry matter to carbon. Root levels can go down to one metre and grazer reddish is an example. We have trialled 19 different blends of legumes, clovers, grasses, brassicas and subtropical varieties. These photos show legumes extracting nitrogen from the atmosphere and carbon crops growing by photosynthesis, removing CO2 from the atmosphere. The example of legumes are a Basics 200 blend, red, arrowleaf, persian, eastern star and subclovers, and fescue, coxfoot and brome. All our 10 centimetre soil testing, mineral balance and carbon crop seeding is done with consultation with Basics of Warrigal. We have been trialling grasses and crops for over 10 years together. We have also added a colony of bubus, bison, dung beetles to bury manure and we have a Bactivate trial running on M14. Grazing management practices. Grazing management is practice for high growth rates of crops, cattle and carbon, therefore maximising returns. Time in and out of paddocks depends on rainfall at the time and stock numbers. Maximum carbon is produced by leaving as much matter in the paddock as possible. This can be done by both grazing and mulching. For maximum carbon, do not remove silage or hay. We use Inspired Ag Solutions, Pete Ronalds, for all our carbon testing and evaluation of results. A paddock or paddocks are selected and a drill core is taken to one metre in depth at random locations. Each core sample taken is from 0 to 10, 10 to 30, 30 to 45 and 45 to 100 centimetres, all bagged separately. This is sent to EAL government approved laboratory where they are tested with the results sent back to Inspired Ag Solutions. Pete checks all figures and gives back a tonnes of total organic carbon per hectare report. Any follow-up testing is done at the same GPS positioning as the first test. This slide shows a core sample to 100 centimetres. You'll notice that the clay soil this holds carbon better than other soil types. The below photo shows a random sampling positions in paddocks on Bimberdine. 
Changes in pasture health. Our pastures have become denser and greener with the improved moisture retention. Missing trace elements have been applied and that has assisted in growth. We have programs for soil health ongoing. We now have the new variety Buson Bison Dung Beetles and a Bactivate trial is being conducted on M14. Our bacterial count is 614. Above 600 is considered excellent. Our stocking rate is 82 pure Angus cows with 82 calves, 20 heifers, 26 steers and two bulls. There are also 2,000 24-7 free-range carbon neutral laying hens, hundreds of wildlife in wallabies and Cape Barring geese. We have 59 paddocks on 128 hectares, which gives you an average of two hectares per paddock. Stock health is excellent with 100% cows to calves, one died and we have one set of twins. Most of these have been covered, but I see here water quality and carbon value. Water is the most precious commodity on earth. There is no life without water. All Bimberdine stock water is transferred by reticulation, wind and solar. All is collected from rainfall and an on-site freshwater bore. We have access to recycled water from Western Port Water for irrigation of carbon crops. This water is also suitable for stock in dry conditions. We are drought proof if people keep using the toilet. We have an online website, which is www.carbonneutralonline, or one word, .com.au. The gallery page will show drone identification maps of Bimberdine. The Carbon Newsletter has current events in the latest news section. And M16 is now being updated to the end of September. Five year satellite information may be viewed showing changes at Bimberdine by colour. Clients. Our first insetting clients were Dynamic Australia Proprietary Limited of Melbourne in 2017 18. We would like to thank them for leading the way in reducing their greenhouse gas emissions and removing their balance from carbon sequestered in the soils at Bimberdine. We have also offset Luminary Digital Proprietary Limited in Melbourne with branches in Sydney, Brisbane and Bali. Acacia Environment Management, Two Bays Brewery, and Cow CWA, the first in Australia to be carbon neutral. Many businesses and persons on Phillip Island are carbon neutral, including recently both New Haven and Cow's veterinary clinics. Totally renewable Phillip Island, Trippy for short www.totallyrenewablephilipisland.weebly.com. Phillip Island can be carbon neutral by 2030. An amazing group of dedicated people working together as a team to make it happen. Public Carbon Auction. On the 8th of September 2019, at an open day 
to showcase electric vehicles and trippy activities. Phillip Island Landcare, Trippy and Bimberdine held a public auction in the packed Civic Centre in Cowes. 350 tonnes of CO2 equivalent were auctioned. The first historical package of one tonne sold for $800 after spirited bidding. This is believed to be a world record price. Many different packages were sold for a total of $11,000. Raise for Trippy. Portion of this will assist in carbon farming. Understanding and valuing ecosystem services. I believe farmers will receive carbon credits from the government for biodiversity and caring for the land. Our local Bass Coast Council have for years rewarded farmers for good land management, tree planting and weed control with a rate reduction. The increase in water retention on a farming property that is able to increase their carbon percentage by one is between 150 to 160,000 litres per hectare, depending on the soil types. Good management on farms such as superior genetics in cattle for growth rate will reduce methane emissions in cattle due to a faster turnoff period. Bimberdine has had a 100% calving rate for years, with this year one death and one set of twins to balance the ratio. If the Asparagopsis seaweed trial that is proven to reduce methane emissions by 90% can be applied to grass-fed cattle by including in hay or silage by, say, liquid form, it will save two tonnes of CO2 equivalent per beef animal per annum. I'd like to finish this report by quoting a few statements in the Carbon Farmers of Australia Special Report of 2011. On page two, a carbon offset is a measured reduction in emissions in one place to compensate for emissions made in another. It can also be a measured removal of CO2 from the atmosphere by carbon sequestration. Mandatory market versus the voluntary market. The voluntary market is the place where companies wanting to become carbon neutral can buy offsets equal to their entire emissions, hence the word voluntary. On page four, Carbon must not only be measured, it must also be verified. All activity must be accurately measured. Each offset credit must stand for one tonne of CO2 equivalent. Auditing must be independent. On page six, on the 14th of August 2010, Prime Minister Julia Gillard announced the Carbon Farming Initiative, a price on carbon. That then would have led the world. Farmers and landowners will benefit from a new income stream. Tony Burke stated that farmers that store carbon in soils and vegetation will also get cash. The following is a comment that is not in the Carbon Farmers Special Report. I believe, unfortunately, that the Abbott government turned this price on carbon to a tax on carbon for political purposes. This set Australia back 10 years and still counting with no end in sight with the present coalition government. Page nine, voluntary scheme. It makes available to Australian companies and consumers a source of Australian offsets that they may purchase to offset their emissions so they can make an advertising claim that their products are carbon neutral or simply to make contribution to climate change by offsetting a family's emissions. 
Page 10, Methodologies. Make your own. A methodology is a step-by-step -step plan for helping farmers earn offsets. There is no limit to the number of methodologies because the carbon market is a free enterprise system. Individuals are free to trade with each other so long as they do not break the law. Our journey began in 1956 and we are still together in 2021. Anne and I are fortunate that our family shares our love of Bimberdine and plan to care for it into the future. Thank you very much, everybody. Bob and Ann Davey, October 2021. There's an amazing uh, cartoon about methane that Bob was keen to share as well. So I will just get that ready now. We're told that cows are a big part of the climate problem. But are they really? It's true that cows emit methane, a strong greenhouse gas. But whereas CO2 from burning fossil fuel stays in the atmosphere for potentially 1,000 years, methane stays for around 12 years before it breaks down. So let's look at what part cows play in that. Cows eat grass and methane is released when they belch and also from their manure. After 12 years or so, that methane breaks down into natural or biogenic CO2 in water. The grass absorbs the CO2 through photosynthesis and turns it into carbohydrate. Cows eat the grass and the whole cycle starts again. Because of this cycling of carbon, if cattle numbers stay the same, eventually, the methane produced by cattle will not contribute additional global warming. However, CO2 produced from burning fossil fuels is CO2 that is new to the atmosphere. It does not stem from this natural carbon cycle. It builds on what's already there day after day, year after year. What's really exciting is if we reduce methane emissions from cows using innovative technologies and grazing practices, such as improving their diet, the red meat and livestock industry can be part of the climate solution. Roger that. And I think, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Anne and Bob, but I believe that the meat industry has actually just announced it's intending to be carbon neutral by 2030. Am I right in that? Oh, yeah, that's a few years ago they've announced that. Ah. They're going to be carbon neutral by 2030. Very good. And that's, uh, that's reasonably easy to do. Uh, but you need farmers to be carbon testing to evaluate how much carbon they've got in their soils. Many, many farmers would be carbon neutral, but they they don't realise it because they don't they haven't tested. A lot of farmers haven't tested uh, to know how much carbon they've got. Mm. Yeah. So thank you so much, Anne and Bob, for sharing those stories and your experiences with us. And I've been very fortunate in being able to come and chat with you at Bimberdeen, which has been absolutely delightful. And I'm constantly surprised, amazed and delighted by all of the things that you have been doing and I guess the precedents you've been setting to inspire others in both farming and on the island. I just can't thank you enough for everything you've done over your lifetimes. But thank you for the, thank opp you, for the opportunity. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm pleased I could provide a little bit of light entertainment as well. <laughs> yeah, I think it gave it a nice break. Yes. <laughs> Uh, well, I might um, hand over to anyone who is here, and we do have a few people sort of with cameras off as well. So if anybody does want to ask any questions or expand on anything that was shared today, please uh, feel free to jump in. Glenn, I think you've politely got your hand up. 
<laughs> yes, not sure of the etiquette, but uh, but yes, look, um, hi and well done, Bob and Anne. You, <laughs> your, your journey's still going very, very well. Um, really pleased Thanks, to see and you two looking very well. Um, probably more of a technical question, Bob, because I've had a lot to do with you over the years. Um, your production rates, how how are they going over the last 10 years? Are you, are you seeing an increase in your kilograms that you're getting off the farm? In kilograms in cattle or kilograms in carbon? <laughs> no, no, talking about the, the bit that you make money out of, so yeah. the, the cows. Well, the cows, yeah. Well, we're making money out of both now, but yeah. kilograms of beef, yes, because of the improved uh, pastures and the improved breeding. So the genetics of the breeding with a faster turnoff means less methane anyway. But, um, yeah, we're, look, we're seeing an improvement in everything. Our carbon's going up. We're concentrating on improving the carbon. Uh, the exciting thing is the asparagopsis taxiformis seaweed, which will virtually cut the methane emissions down to nothing. So that's that's huge for the Australian beef industry. Um, so yeah, it, yes, all good. To answer your question, uh, <laughs> yes, we are doing well. Not to mention that the prices of cattle are sky high at the moment. <laughs> And the carbon has actually gone. In all the auctions from the ERF, they average $14.35 sorry, $14.35 a tonne of CO2 equivalent. And today they're now $25 a tonne compared to $80, $90, $100 a tonne in, in Switzerland. So that's how far behind. Australia is to the rest of the world. And Bob, I'm curious, I guess, as a trippy person and looking at obviously being carbon neutral by 2030, but do you see a way or a time frame that farmers could farm carbon as profitably as they could, say, cattle or, or other cropping or livestock? Do you think it's a viable future for farming? Yeah, I do. I do. Um, I mentioned that to somebody and they laughed at me. Uh, but I noticed that just recently there was a uh, an article put out by Ross Garno, who is a great believer in soil sequestration of carbon. And he stated that it could be as valuable as the Australian wool industry. That's a pretty big statement to come out with, that carbon could be as valuable as the wool industry in Australia. So, yes, I believe that I believe that if you had all the evidence there, uh, you would have enough carbon in the soils to be able to offset a huge amount of business and everything on Phillip Island. That, that's what I believe, though, you know, everybody mightn't believe that, but if Trippy were able to organise, you know, more parts of the island to be carbon neutral and actually know what's in the soil, that would be great. We'll do our best, Bob. <laughs> uh, oh, Helen, have you got a question? Oh, Bob, I was just wondering about with the seaweed. So is that something that you're looking at, um, like growing and developing yourself, or is it something that you're going to have to purchase um, um, sure with your trials what your plans were? Yeah, look, I'm going, I'm, I'm, we've got a saltwater aquifer, so I'm going to try and uh, trial it in that aquifer just to see if it grows. But it's like a weed in Tasmanian waters, and there's a crowd called Sea Forest, and I've been in touch with them and will possibly be one of the farms involved with it. And that's uh, what they do is they freeze dry it and they, they uh, put a very small amount in feed additive. Uh, and I'm working with them to see if we can get it into a liquid or a, uh, a light powder form and have in a molasses drum, something like that, or in silage or hay 
so that it uh, can be fed to grass feed cattle. It'll be easily done in feedlot cattle, but if you could do it in grass feed cattle, it'd be huge. And Bob, that's another question. Do you do you have any problems now with weeds that you plants you don't want there, or have you pretty much been able to eliminate? No, we've 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 eliminated weeds. We've we've virtually got no weeds, and what come up in the way of a few Scotch thistles, we um, we just matic them out. So we haven't we haven't got any problem weeds. We get a bit of cape weed from time to time. And we do spray that. We can spray that with a light spray, and that's a spray graze. So the cattle go in at about seven days later and they graze it right down. No effects on anything except keeping the cape weed down. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, I think we're, uh, well, I was going to say we're dead on time, but with all of the theatrics during the show, we're two minutes over. <laughs> but, that's um, not bad. That's, not, That's bad. not bad considering. I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. And I'm constantly inspired by Anne and Bob and your endeavours. So I hope we've managed to spread a bit more inspiration and even acknowledgement for all of the work that you've done. And um, I look forward to uh, putting possibly a slightly edited version of this recording <laughs> up on the Trippy YouTube <laughs> channel, which is... Uh, currently in development. So um, stay tuned and I'll endeavour to let all of you guys know when, when it's up there with some other great resources as well. And um, Bob, we are very keen, of course, to promote what you are doing as well through Phillip Island and, and beyond. So thank you again for all of your efforts and leading the way. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks. Cheers, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Glenn. Thanks, Bob. Bye. 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 Glenn, Helen.